Okay, that guy's a heretic. That guy's a heretic. That's a heretic. There's a heretic. There's a lot of heretics out there, but who is a heretic? Even more to the point, what is a heretic? We talk a lot about heretics, who's a heretic, that's a heretic, that's a heretic, or what heresies are. You've just offered up heresy. We might level at someone. But the question is, before we can even talk about who a heretic is, and some people stand out, and I mean in a demonstrable way, stand out as a heretic, even if you don't even know what the definition of a heretic is, they just, if I, whatever the definition of it is, that person is, it looks like, smells like, must be a heretic. But the question is, what is a heretic? And what is heresy? I think some people are going to be surprised to find out really what the, the basic definition of it is. Who can be a heretic? And does all heresy qualify as a person who gives it to be a heretic? There's a couple of passages that come up in the Bible that we point to. And I don't know if we actually think about what this word is. Now, this word can be used as a noun in terms of an adjective to describe a noun. It can be used as a verb as well. But in this case, let's go to a couple passages that, that we get a lot of traction on, that we speak a lot about. And one of them is 2 Peter 2.1. So let's go there. It says, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you. Now, by the way, the term false prophet, false teacher, they kind of go hand in hand. They coincide. They can be interchangeable, be false prophet, false teacher, because a prophet or a teacher is someone that is informing, telling. So it's literally what the word prophet uh, refers to. So someone who informs, tells, uh, gives revelation. Now, in this case, these are faulty revelations, faulty information, or as we would like to say nowadays, misinformation. Uh, they will come among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies. Notice how it says secretly, but destructive heresies. So does that imply that all heresies are not destructive? And then what actually is a destructive heresy? And before I go into what the word hereo mean or this particular word, I want to go next to another passage that we see. And this is in Titus 3, 9. It says, but avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law, law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. Now look what he says in verse 10. Reject a factious man after a second, first and second warning, knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. Uh, condemned. Now he's speaking about a person who they're in this particular state. This is what they do. Not a person who might do or say so maybe once or twice, which is the reason why you would warn such a person. But going back to it, the word that's used, and I have it underlined, same word, hireo, and we have it here, the word we get the word heretic, uh, hereticon anthropon. So this person, hereticon in this case, is an adjective describing the man. This person is a, or you might see here, a factious man or a heretical man. This is who he is. This is how this person is known. It's almost like a person who goes out and you and I might go out and one day just decide to get a basketball, go on the basketball court and play basketball. But most folks would not describe us as a basketball player or I might go in the kitchen and cook. You won't describe me as a chef, though I'm cooking at the moment. Lord knows my family wouldn't describe me as that. But here is a person that this is how they are described. This is what adjective do. They, this person, this word is modifying this noun, describing this noun as a heretic. So what is a heretic? What is heresy? Well, the word heretic or heresy at its basic level can refer to a division, a sect. It can refer to a school of something. Uh, it can refer to what people are causing some sort of div uh, uh, dissensions or divisions. Uh, and so is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, in some cases, it's just simply just a generic term referring to a group or a school of or a sect of something. For example, let's go to Paul being described this way. Paul is being brought up on charges by a man by the name of Tertullus, who is actually giving this like a little legal proceedings to bring these charges against Paul. And as they're describing to Paul, uh, he says that he is of this sect, this heretic, this, heret this heretical sect, this division of Judaism. And then Paul is giving a uh, a recount or a defense of himself. But before we go there in Acts 24, let's start in verse 13. Uh, Paul says, nor can they prove the, uh, the charges of which they now accuse me. But this I admit to look what he says, uh, that according to the way which they call a sect and the word for sect is the same word for heresy, same word that's used there. Uh, 
the way that which they call a sect, I do serve the God of our fathers, believing everything that is in accordance with the law. Now, so they're, they're calling this what I am, Paul, what I'm a part of, a sect of Judaism. What he's saying is what I'm doing is I am serving the Lord. As a matter of fact, what Paul was being accused of is being uh, part of a sect or a heresy of Judaism. And they call this of the Nazarene. So going back to that passage, he says that for we have found this man, speaking about Paul, a real pest and a fellow who stirs up dissension among the Jews throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarene. So they're calling the Nazarenes, these believers of the way that Paul calls them, of the way these Christians calling them a sect, calling what they're doing heresy, being heretical, stirring up divisions. Now, in this case, if that's the case, fine, that's a good thing. But what about as it regards to us as believers? Because yes, the world may refer to us as a sect. The world may uh, refer to us as heretical based on their outlook. But we're, we're referring to and we're thinking about the true outlook compared to God. How does God view someone as a heretic? Because that's ultimately what's important. Well, clearly, according to Second Peter, that it is these destructive heresies that are the issues and they even deny the matter or someone could say they even they lead to denying of the master or also along with that, they are denying the master uh, in some way, shape or fashion. A heresy, something that's heretical will ultimately lead people astray. There is a distorted view of the Bible of the gospel of Christ and so forth. And it's harmful to someone's walk. And so if someone is actually delivering heresies, that's what they end up doing. And they either part of that ends up causing them to deny the master, or they could end up also along with that denying the master. It's not totally clear uh, how you would read this. Uh, either way is fine. The word that Kai is there is this word exegetical, or is just saying something also with this. Either way, it's fine. We just know that it affects somebody's walk in the Lord. Now, there's a positive angle to heresy, and there's also a negative. Let's first deal with the negative, and this is the one that we think of often. But let's go back to the Old Testament. The word heresy isn't used, but the the the, uh, the understanding, the concept is still there. And this is in Proverbs 6.16. It says, there are six things which the Lord hates. Yes, seven which are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that deceives the wicked, plans, uh, feet that run rapidly to evil. And here it is, a false witness who utters lies and one who spreads strife among the brethren, one who sows, deep, who sows discords among the brethren, one who's causing separation, divisions, dissensions among the brethren. That is something that the Lord cannot tolerate. That is something that the Lord abhors. Now, there is a need, there is a desire um, there is a, or should say, a usefulness to heresy, to factions, to divisions. As a matter of fact, if we go to First Corinthians, he's talking about the Lord's table uh, and that the way that there was this uh, ungodly way that people were doing things and there was division that, that, that arose about that. But notice what Paul says in that. He says in First Corinthians, starting verse 18, he says, For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions uh, exist, where we get the word schisms, exist among you. And in part, I believe it. For there must be, in the word day means it's necessary also for there to be factions. And the word factions, why it's underlined, is the word hereo or uh, heresies. There must be factions or heresies among you. Why? So that those who are approved may become evident among you. In other words, when you see true doctrine, true teaching, something true of the word of God, and you compare it to those that are heretical, there's a clear difference. There should be a distinction. If the, heres, if the heretic sticks out, that's a good thing. There should be a clear distinction. And as a matter of fact, if you are in the Lord and you love the word and you know the word, you will begin to see a clear distinction. So when you see people doing certain things, it's evident who they are. There are certain groups that we just have to categorize as heretical. There's some that may possibly, maybe a particular group that's not a heresy or a heretic, uh, but fringes of that particular group maybe are groups that, or things that we would say that are certainly heretical and are heresies uh, and that we should avoid groups such as the Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, as well as the Catholic Church. Now, is it possible that someone that's in those groups could actually place their faith in Christ and be genuine brothers in Christ? Sure, it happens all the time where someone is in one of those heretical groups, part of those heresies, 
they don't understand it and know it well enough. And so they place their faith in Christ because the Lord has touched and worked in them. And then ultimately they end up leaving those places. And then there are other groups that are also that we might consider to be in mainline Christianity, which really aren't mainline. They're just becoming more and more prominent or more and more numerous groups such as the word of faith. Without question, that is a heretical group. Uh, anything or anyone that distorts the deity of Christ or puts on common level on even footing us saying that maybe we are little son, I mean, little gods, or we are just like him. We have the same power. When I read in the Bible where he says, I am, I just smile and say, yes, I am too. You tap into who you really are. You know what the Bible calls you? It says you are little Elohim. Huh. You are a little God. Twist it around and get it to say what you want. You can make the Bible say anything you want it to. Like right now, you're looking at a person who is not just a person. Somehow, God is in me, and there's a sense in which I am like God and man all at once. When the teaching distorts and misinforms a person walks, if it harms a person's walk, then that is heretical and heresy. Does that make the person that believes that? Does it make that to be that person to be a heretic? No, not necessarily. For example, someone who may teach or believe that a Christian can have a demon. That is a heresy. It distorts a Christian's walk. It distorts the truth. As a matter of fact, there's no biblical basis for it. But does it make a person who believes that, does it make that person necessarily a heretic? Not necessarily. Again, you can be misinformed as a Christian. You can genuinely and sincerely think something is, and it be false, and what you believe might hurt someone. It may take a while to come to the, to the truth of the matter, or you may never, but doesn't make you necessarily a heretic. Now it could, doesn't mean that you won't be, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you are. But rest assured, if you find yourself walking in a manner that is unlike what we see in the scriptures and causes a distortion amongst or regarding salvation, how you get saved, how you stay saved, those sorts of things, big argument. But, and I'm not saying about one saved, always serve, saved versus losing salvation. I'm not talking about that. But I mean, in terms of you've got to do these particular rituals and do certain things to your body and so forth and live a certain way. For example, like a Hebrew Israelite clearly a heretical group nothing even christian about them but there is an example and so for that reason we look at romans 16 17 where paul says now i urge you brethren keep an eye on those who cause and look at the word cause the word that are this is a uh, present active participle these are people who are doing um intentionality is here in play causing dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learn and turn away from them so that if there's a people there's a person who is doing this and there seems as i said an intentionality and it's constantly that is a person that you want to avoid now do we need to ascertain if the person is doing so intentionally or ignorantly we absolutely need to because a person may just simply need to be instructed you think about apollos if apollos were to have continued to teach um the gospel minus the holy spirit but only up to John's baptism today, we would say, wait a second, that's pretty heretical. But all it took was someone to pull him to the side, Priscilla and Aquila to pull him to the side and say, hey, listen, this is what it is. Here is what he was preaching of. And then so what does Apollos do? He becomes might, even more mighty in the Lord. As a matter of fact, there are those that even want to kind of divide themselves up that Paul brings up in 1 Corinthians, that there are those who want to say that I'm of Paul, I'm of Cephas, I'm of a a policy. And so sometimes you need to ascertain and find if the person is actually just unaware and just by simply giving them the scriptures, they see it because a heretic is going to reject the truth without question, which is why they stand out. A heretic wants to avoid the scriptures as much as possible. Anyone that wants to lead you away from the centrality of the scriptures being our focus, being preeminent, that person is a heretic. That person needs to be avoided because then they turn on you because then they want you to start using your experience, your feelings. They want you to be more spiritual than you are scriptural. And they might even accuse you of not relying on the Holy Spirit, whereas the scriptures teach us how to rely on the Holy Spirit, whereas they teach you how to feel. And you can end up in all sorts of uh, unbiblical stances and so forth. And so disregard anyone, beware of anyone who is using something outside of the Bible or maybe even using the Bible to move you away from the Bible. God wants to bring more. God wants to bring meat. God wants to bring mysteries. God wants to bring secrets. 
That comes by taking the limits off of him and allowing him to expand upon scripture, bring revelation upon scripture. So we're not limited to the, to the Bible, but God expands. It is vitally important to remember that a heretic or engaging in heresy is from the lust of the flesh. In Galatians 5, 20 says some of the things that are of the lust of the flesh that are obviously counter to uh, being led by the spirit. Verse 20 idolatry, sorceries, enmities, strife, jealousies, outbirth of, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions. Obviously, these aren't good. And then what's there? Factions. The same word, heresies, which is heresies. That word is there also, envy and drunkenness and so forth. And so these people that are intentionally causing these divisions, doctrinally, that's a huge issue. And so what do we do? We are to warn that person if we see that. We are to let them know. If we can obviously help them, then we do so. Now, before we go, I want to also point out one last category that is a bit ironic, and I would call these the ironic heretics. These are the people who make it their mission to point out everyone else's heresy, uh, but in doing so, which is not a problem pointing out heresies, but in nitpicking and calling everything that is not like what you believe, calling that person a heretic. It's one thing to, to say that the people that disagree with what you believe, that that person is in error. That's fine. Because obviously, if you disagree with that person's stance and you think that, that person is wrong, and maybe they are, the point or the problem becomes is if you start causing divisions and saying, we need to leave that person who's a Christian alone because he disagrees with my uh, assessment on Calvinism or Arminianism or uh, dispensationalism and so forth. When we start kicking brothers out because they don't believe exactly like I believe. Let's say I'm a King James Version only. And let's be clear, there are some people in that camp that are heretical. I've even seen people who have gone so far to say that the King James Version informs the Greek. The King James Bible is the word of God, every word of it. Amen. Amen. I can take this book and correct the Greek. Well, that's complete nonsense. But the problem is, though, you've got people like that who think that everyone else who's different, who does not, who will not use a King James Version, that that person is not a Christian. That person is a heretic. That person is misinformed and so forth. And so you want to avoid that. Those are the kind of people that become the ironic heretic. They want to hold so much to scripture, uh, but it's their version of it. And so you want to be careful. It's an easy thing to fall into to where you, you get upset and frustrated by the, the multiple numbers of heretical teachings that we see, the intentional distortion of the gospel, and just outright and blatant mockery. There's a tendency because you're bothered by that, that you want to be on the lookout for that. And then you overcompensate and you call everything that's not like what you see to be heresy or everyone to be a heretic. You want to be careful of that. You want to be careful if you are maybe, say, uh, on YouTube and you and you call yourself a uh, discernment minister or you have a discernment ministry. In truth, there is no such thing as a discernment ministry. We are to be discerning as believers and we should be serving as ministers of the gospel. But there is no such thing. But I get it. If that's what you do, make sure there's a balance. Make sure there's also a balance with actually preaching and teaching the gospel and leading that and leading, leading people to that one by your own example, but then others by your word. And so be careful. You don't fall into the category of being someone not as a, uh, a heresy hunter, which you should not be. You should not be a heresy hunter. You should happen to see a heresy and then destroy the heresy or confront the heresy when it comes to you because there's enough heresy out there that you don't have to go looking for it. It will come your way and then you call it out while you are leading people to Christ, while you are promoting the true adherence of the gospel. And so we don't want to be obviously intentional heretics, nor do we want to be ironic, unintentional heretics. What we want to do is be true defendants of the faith, as Jude says, to contend for the faith and be on guard for anyone that brings about a doctrine or teaching that divides the body away from the truth. And so if this is a pattern, it's ongoing, which is why the present active participle is used. If it's intentional, if it's causing divisions and if it distorts and harms the walk of a believer, that is a heretic, that is heresy, and that person and that thing should be called out. Amen.